Glad to be here. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you are a panelist, so you should be able to share your screen. Looks like I'm still disabled. Uh, okay, let us fix that. There you go. Perfect. It seemed to work. Okay. Can you see this okay? Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks again for having me. This is um, obviously one of one of my favorite topics because um, you know I'm all about moving things to whatever technology you can so that you can actually focus more on um, the good stuff, which is you know forecasting, cash flow planning, all of that um, to really help your business grow. So before we can really do that, we have to go into a paperless cloud-based world, which is the first step. Um, and uh, I'm about to take you through that process. I mean, I think it's a lot bigger than maybe 40 minutes, but um, I thought I could give you a really nice high level view of what that might look like um, to, to get you started. Okay. So on the agenda today, um, I'm gonna start off with, uh, first of all, like some of the myths about accounting and paper. I think there's a few of them out there um, that you know, me as an accountant I've heard of and probably other accountants out there have, have heard of, uh, just to kind of give you an idea as to like why this is coming up a lot, especially right now. Um, I'm gonna look at the actual difference between paper and desktop accounting versus paperless and cloud-based. Why does this actually matter? Because there's always a so what to every issue. Uh, when you should actually make the transition, what support is out there for you to make the transition and then, of course, the bulk of this will be in the steps. And that's where I'll really go through the apps out there and the processes available to make that happen. And at the very end, um, we'll take a look at questions uh, with the few minutes we have. So I, I think, like Chris said, there's like a question and answer. So if you want to start throwing questions in throughout this presentation, um, we'll take some time to make sure they get answered at the end. Okay, so um, myths about accounting. Um, there's, these are a few ones, I feel like some of them might be a little bit old, but something I always like to talk about, especially when we talk about why we wanna do this. Um, so number one, CRA requires me to keep all my physical receipts and tax return schedules on hand for any future audits. Um, in a way, yes, you have to keep your information on hand for a number of years to you know, provide them if this were to occur but um, CRA actually accepts records that are inaccessible and readable electronic format. So no, you don't actually need to keep your paper. Um, everything these days can be scanned, pictures taken, as long as they're um, readable, they can be submitted to CRA. Uh, physical receipt storage is more secure than online. I mean, I would say these days, probably not because um, physical means it's in one place and only accessed in that one place. So if you were to move to, um, you know, a virtual world, uh, you're going to have to have more copy than just that one. Um, and so the longer you keep your receipts, the more damaged and unreadable they will actually get. So therefore not really secure anymore. Your credit card statement should work just fine in case of an audit. Um, that's an interesting one because I have had one audit where they did actually accept a credit card statement, but it's very rare and you have to get a really nice auditor to make that happen. Um, so I think the, the thing with this one is that you actually need proper invoices and receipts as an acceptable support if they were to ever audit you. And so this kind of leads into why it's important to keep it online and organized because this may most likely will occur at some point in the future. And of course, the funny one is I have an accountant, so I don't really need to keep organized or keep my receipts. Um, I, yeah, so <laughs> false because your accountant, you know, I guess in a way will be able to make reasonable estimates when it's warranted and there's like certain things where, you know, it's really based on reasonability. Um, I'm pretty practical that way as well. But at the same time, you really should st still keep this data on hand. So you don't necessarily need it when you're filing your returns, but you do need it if they were to ever ask for it a couple years down the road. So just some fun little things to, to think about when you think about why you would want to move to the cloud. Um, now we can look at really the difference of this. And I think it's pretty obvious, but I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page of what it can and can't do. Uh, paper and desktop 
is hard to access um, if it does have to sit in one place. So generally speaking, if you have paper, it's on a desk or filed. Um, and if you have a desktop accounting software, it's generally installed on one desktop or one computer, uh, which makes it pretty hard to access, I would say, especially if you have to move your uh, business to a remote situation overnight, which has happened to many. Um, if you do have paperless and cloud-based, it can be accessed anywhere, wherever, as long as you have Wi-Fi that works. Um, and these days you can even have an iPad or an iPhone to access it. It doesn't necessarily have to be a laptop, but Wi-Fi is key. Um, for paper and desktop, data can only be updated when someone is manually updating it. Um, that is definitely a time consuming um, when you're getting your books up to date it's you know you know it, it used to be you have to enter in each transaction or each bank transaction to actually reconcile it nowadays it's actually updated automatically so um, your bank feeds through these apps that i'm going to talk about later on and um, it's cutting out probably 50 percent of your time just getting it automatically updated in the background and lastly, um, for paper and desktop, only one person can access these documents at a time. I mean, in most circumstances, um, I think that really limits, uh, you know, what you can do and who can be in there at a time, because these days you might have a bookkeeper in there, you might have a CFO in there and you might have, um, you know, a tax accountant or uh, maybe management is in there as well. And so ideally you can have multiple users reviewing at once updating the books, reviewing the financials, and everything is still getting updated so that you're not waiting for one person to close it and pass it on to you. Um, that's very old school nowadays and um, having that multiple user access is super ideal. So why do you care? Um, and I think it's super important to really explain um, the why of all this and the so what. Um, you know, it is a big process to do this. And so it's, you know, super ideal to really understand, um, you know, the reasons of making this happen. So number one, I always put this as number one because growth is, you know, a lot of what we help with. I mean, a lot of businesses we help, they do want to grow or they have a goal in mind. Um, and so really having business owners understand where they are financially is going to enable them to move forward and forecast going forward and cash flow planning and all of that. And so just having that clear understanding of where you are is going to help you with that. Um, and that does lead us to cash flow. So cash flow number one is um, super important, especially when you're in a pandemic. Being more aware of your cash position frequently will help you when you run into something like this. So if you're prepared and you know exactly where you stand, um, the easier you're going to be able to, you know, change things around, cut costs, whatever it is you need to do to kind of get through these times. Reporting, that's a really big one that most companies have to deal with, um, whether it's your annual uh, return, tax return, notice to reader, whatever it may be. Um, just having accounting reports ready to go or, you know, ready to send off to your accountant is super ideal. Um, and these days too, it super handy to um, send off for a loan application or investors are requesting information or these days banks have been requesting quite a bit of info. Um, so just being able to go in and pull what you need is great and you, won't, you, you no longer have to wait for the end of the year to actually do that. And last but not least, audits. It's not necessarily something we like to talk about or hear, but um, sooner or later, you will probably come across an audit. And let me tell you, it's a lot easier to deal with them if you have everything ready to go, all of your receipts attached to all the transactions. Um, and so accessing you know, all of that right away and giving CRA their information within their 30-day notice period, it feels pretty good. Um, so. So those are some really key reasons on why this matters. There's probably many more, but I've just narrowed it down to the top ones that I can think of. And so when should you actually make this transition? Um, it's nef definitely not like an overnight situation. It does take time. My answer is always right now, of course, like let's, let's get this, let's do this now. Um, but to be honest, um, it does take time and making an action plan so that you're ready to go at your ideal transition date is key. 
Um, you need to put that time in there to learn about all these systems, how they work together, or hire some to do it. But at the, at the end of the day, you really need to make sure that you're fully on board with this as it's happening so that you can you know, do it, get it done, and really make that transition. And so if you were to kind of go about this, or if there's accountants out there that are looking to do this, um, what support is out there? For, you know, for one, the, the really easy one is the accounting app support. So I will talk a little bit more about what these apps are, but some of them do have demos and training um, so that, you know, I think some of them even have like certifications so you can really um, learn about the apps before you start using them. So I always take, that, take advantage of doing that. Some apps also offer onboarding plans. So um, depending on the app, you can actually, you know, potentially pay a little bit more to get someone to actually onboard you on so that everything is seamless and working well. Um, so that's some, sometimes nice if you're unsure of making that on your own. Um, accountants and bookkeepers who are well versed in this transition can definitely help you implement. Um, there's a lot of us out there that do this all the time and understand the quirks that go on while you're doing it. And so if you can get that support, especially in that transition, it can sometimes help, help you along. And lastly, um, there's also other business owners or, or business groups or accountants or any, or any sort of groups that can help get advice and feedback from so that when you're doing this, you kind of know what apps to use, maybe based on your industry or what's worked in the past, what hasn't worked. And so generally speaking, you know, it's, it's good to get in on that. And so you, you know kind of what you're getting yourself into. And so um, the bulk of all of this is really the steps in how we make this happen. And um, a lot of that will be based on apps that I'm gonna talk about. That's kind of the core of where this all comes from. And it's really connecting those apps with processes to create an, an efficient and scalable um, accounting cycle in your business so that you can actually do more with it. Um, so number one is cloud-based accounting. So before you add any apps into it, you really need an accounting system that's going to work well, that's going to connect with all these apps and be kind of like the core or the heart of your accounting cycle. Um, so keep in mind, there's going to be a ton of apps out there, um, but I'm only really narrowing it down to my top one or two that I would highly suggest. Um, and even with that, we, I'll, I'll provide um, our virtual CFO recommendation at the end of all of this as, as well. Um, but Xero and QuickBooks Online, they're, they're, they're great uh, to start with. I think they're sort of pretty much in line in terms of what they can do. Um, they offer many integrations with other apps. So that's kind of like the key is you really want something that is going to work with various apps, depending on where your business is and what integrations you need. Um, and of course, like I mentioned before, they connect to bank feeds for live updates. So ideally you get these, um, you, you sort of connect all your bank, bank accounts, credit cards, whatever it is that you have transactions flowing through constantly um, and have that update in the background. So it's a lot less for you to do um, on the bookkeeping side if you know that's already flowing through for you. And the reporting is user friendly and clear. So um, the, the reporting, like I mentioned before, it can give you all of these reports or you know, support that you need for all of those stakeholders that we talked about. And um, you know, having something that you can use and change and create um, is super important for making it really like easy, easy and easy to produce and easy to get out. So our recommendation is 100% zero. Um, we actually use that for a majority of our clients. Um, we're very well versed in it and um, you know, always helping or answering questions on that. Uh, we do have a lot of info on our website as well about zero and what it can do. So any questions, obviously we can help out with that. QBO, we still use um, just less, you know, less so. We just think that with zero, the, the reporting is super bang on for what we need and um, it just it works well for, for our types of clients. So number two, um, now you really need that receipt management system. So this is tying back to all of those uh, great myths about paper and you know, what you need for support and CRA and all of that. And 
number one is really to have a receipt management system um, honed in so that you get um, all of that support integrated with your accounting system. HubDoc and Receipt Bank, um, those are some really great ones we, we've used. Um, I think there, there's a lot of the other ones out there. I think there's even free versions out there, but this, the, these two really work well for what we need and especially for higher volume. Um, there are desktop and mobile versions available. So you're you know, able to actually use your phone to take pictures of receipts. So if you get you know, a parking receipt or you know, some sort of paper copy, you just snap a picture and upload it immediately and get rid of that receipt. It, it, once it's uploaded, it's sort of saved in, in an area that you don't have to think about anymore. Um, and same with email receipts. So these days, you know, subscriptions and all of that gets directly emailed to you. Um, you just forward it to an email related to HubDog or Receipt Bank, something that's provided to you and get rid of it. It's kind of saved, it's set aside and ready to be um, reviewed and imported into your accounting system. And so obviously these are great because they connect to Xero and QBO um, with their direct integration so that all bills are up to date um, and you have a clear view of what your accounts payable looks like. Our recommendation is definitely HubDoc. Um, Zero has actually purchased HubDoc, so they now, Zero offers a free uh, subscription of HubDoc if you were to purchase a Zero subscription. So it's obviously our go-to, it's a no-brainer, and um, HubDoc is actually nice because it also offers the option to pull in your bank statements and credit card statements. So if you're um, dealing with a tax accountant or someone who needs to pull that information, a bookkeeper, um, it can pull in directly to HubDoc so that you don't have to actually give that information over or uh, you don't have to give them bank access. So it's kind of a nice perk to add on. Um, okay, so invoicing and payment terms. That is uh, another piece that is really gonna drive from paper to online. Um, I mean, I don't know if anyone actually takes checks or pays with check anymore, but now is really the time to move away from that. Um, I think really good ones are credit cards and electronic funds transfer, EFT. That's a, that's a big one there. And um, Pluto is, is great for the EFT electronic funds transfer. So um, that, that's one that we use a lot. You can actually receive payments from customers and you can pay payments to vendors. So it's a really nice one to use for everything if, you're, if you wanna limit it. We also use GoCardless, which is um, attached to zero. It's really nice for receiving payments. Um, so that's a good one. And then uh, Stripe. So Stripe is um, also a great option to take in payments. So credit cards, if um, you're in a situation where you have international clients or something like that and you don't want to take in wires, Stripe is a really nice way to you know, take credit card payments. It is 3%, so it is a higher fee. Um, so not necessarily recommended if it's a high dollar amount you're, you're getting. And um, of course, all of these can connect to Xero and QBO because we want all of this to integrate nicely, mark payments as paid, um, and make life easier for bookkeepers, accountants, and business owners. So our recommendation, I mean, technically speaking, we like electronic funds transfer because, you know, it's a lot cheaper and it can do a whole lot with incoming and outgoing. Um, but with that said, we use um, GoCardless, Pluto, Stripe personally with our business, and we use it for a lot of clients. Um, all of them work really well for different reasons. So it's just finding that one that works uh, for your business. And the key is to change your invoicing terms to no longer accept check and accepts anything electronic, obviously. That, that, that's that's a, a winning uh, step right there. Okay. Um, so now we kind of move into the payroll side of things, which may not be... Um, relevant to everyone if you don't have payroll or don't have employees, um, maybe not something you're gonna do right away, but something to think about, um, especially if you've moved to that cloud-based system. What, what are you gonna in, implement in that going forward? 
So wage point and payment evolution, they're some great options. Um, they're, uh, you know, in my mind, a no brainer to kind of set up um, and kind of move away to anything more manual process. Um, even if you have one employee or more, I would suggest using something like this. And the reason for that is CRA remittances can be automatically dealt with and paid for. Um, everyone hates to remember to pay CRA and having an option like this so that it's automatically taken care of is definitely uh, something that you would want to think about doing. It's totally worth the money um, and reduces any issues or errors for you know, late payments or reconciliation problems. Um, so definitely something to think about. T4s are also taken care of at year end. Um, so no longer something that like a tax accountant would have to do. Um, it would just automatically be dealt with, just has to be reviewed and approved in the payroll system. So it saves a ton of time there on having to recreate T4s. And then of course, um, it connects to your accounting software because everything should. And it really pushes through those payroll bills so that now your accounting software includes the wages, CPP, EI, all of that correctly uh, so that you, you know, have some of your biggest, biggest expenses accounted for. And um, if CRA were to ever request anything, it's right there. Um, our recommendation is definitely WagePoint. We use them as much as we possibly can. Um, very easy to set up, great for salary employees and easy to do yourself. Like it's, it's totally um, easy to use and, and we really prefer that. So now we're kind of outside of the core, like that, that those were our core apps that we really want to get um, integrated together uh, to really set things up for success. Everything else after that is kind of an add on, like something that might benefit you later on, uh, but not necessary to have immediately. So examples of this, um, just other ways to reduce your paper and move online is human resources. So kind of related to payroll but um, track outside of it. Uh, so if you're getting to a point where you're at three, four plus employees, you're now dealing with employee info, contracts, vacation, raises, benefits, all of that. And so ideally you can actually track that online um, somewhere in one place so that you're not having to go to a file folder in the, in the office. Humi is a great one. Um, they're actually a fairly new tech company and we use them. We use them for a lot of clients. They're, you know, they're always working on their features and I think reasonably priced in terms of what you can do with them. So highly recommend if you want to get that set up. Another one is file management. So this is probably something that a lot of people use already. Um, in my experience, I've seen, I've seen this as kind of like the first step of, of moving online. But um, other than like Microsoft Suite and all of that, there's other options like G Suite and Dropbox. So we actually use both. Um, but, you know, ideally anything that's like online in the cloud that you can easily access if you're up to work from home or that kind of thing. Um, so anything from like contracts, tax returns, financial statements, um, obviously, that's very financial driven, but, you know, that's a lot of the data these days. Um, but even just as simple as customer contracts or um, agreements, that kind of thing, if you can start moving that online, that would be, you know, a huge time saver. Expense reimbursements is not necessarily something you might need right away, but if you do have like sales employees, commission employees, that are traveling or that will be traveling later on. Um, maybe they're sending reports in monthly, every other month. Um, once it starts hitting a point where, you know, it's excessive, um, try automating that to something like Expensify. So that's, uh, I would say it's, it's kind of expensive in terms of like, you know, what, what you can get with that. But I do think it is ideal to, um, really have like an approval process in place, all your receipts scanned in, everything coded correctly, um, and obviously integrated with your accounting system. And then 
CRM, so customer relationship management tools, might not be something you have right away in your business, but as you grow and really build that customer base and pipeline and future relationships, you might have something like Salesforce or HubSpot, and that's very tech-based related, but um, eventually it, it would be nice to have an invoicing system that integrates with your accounting, um, especially if it becomes really complex. Uh, so those are some really nice ones. I know HubSpot does integrate. I don't think Salesforce does currently, but uh, something to think about as you grow. Okay, so um, now that you have all your apps in place, ideally, you now look at the processes to make it happen. So it's one thing to have these apps kind of ready to go and nicely set up, but uh, what's actually, how are you going to keep this updated? Like, what are your processes? Um, so you have to look at who's responsible for this going forward. Is it going to be you as a business owner, is it your accountant, is it a bookkeeper, is it an admin person? Um, you really need to make sure it's updated because it's a shame to have all this set up when you can't keep it updated um, on a recurring basis. Uh, what are your reporting requirements? So maybe you're a business that's just starting and you really just have to annually report, which is fine, um, but you would still wanna keep your books up to date on a monthly basis just to you know, understand truly what's going on in your business and who needs to see it. Um, so maybe it's your tax accountant at your end, maybe it's just management, monthly, quarterly. Maybe you have investors or lenders that are actually requiring you to send information quarterly. So understanding that is really gonna drive like how your systems work going forward, who you might need to review it, that kind of thing. And one of my favorites, well, how can you use this information as a tool to forecast? Um, because that's one of the main reasons you're doing this. You actually want to use this information as something to grow your business. And um, so now you can actually, you know, maybe you're at a point now where it's not just about, you know, getting your books up to date, but how, how can you use that going forward? And how can you um, use this as a tool for like cash flow planning, revenue forecasting, that kind of thing. And of course, at the end, um, you really want to implement it. So you've now developed these apps, integrations, processes, you know, who's dealing with it, and you want to implement your plan. So you want to pick a start date, um, make sure it makes sense and make sure you actually stick with it. Uh, ideally, a lot, I mean, what's common is you pick year end because it is the most clean situation at uh, your tax accountant will thank you as well because they're dealing with one system and not two. Um, but it's also not mandatory. Um, I've done many part, part way through the year transitions. It's, you know, it requires a little more than just plugging in some balances, but um, it is very possible. I've mentioned this before, but um, have someone to convert it over for you or, you know, have a plan to do it yourself. Um, ideally, if you have someone doing it for you, it, it just avoids hiccups along the way. Um, and it doesn't actually take that long when you really get uh, someone that knows what they're doing to do it. Um, so have that in place or have a plan in place to really get it done. And I put this in here because um, I do have, I know people that have kind of done it in steps where they'll add in the accounting system and then the receipt management like four months later. But really like the idea is that all of this works well together um, when they're implemented together. So really try to use those new apps um, at your chosen start date and don't look back, like just, just kind of work with it. Um, that's what's creating that efficiency. And so ideally um, you can kind of work with everything at once and you know, take time to get to know them over the next few months. And then of course, you wanna ensure you have uh, someone to deal, deal with it for you going forward or have someone internally do it. Um, but the key here is like actually keep it up to date because I think sometimes like people will do this and then they'll forget about it for a few months. But I mean, you're doing this so that you really understand what's going on in your system. And um, thankfully the technology is doing a lot of the work for you, but you still need to go in, review, reconcile, make sure things are um, up to date moving forward. 
So all of that in a nutshell, um, that was probably a lot of information. I feel like there's even more information, but I'm, I'm obviously going to limit it at a certain uh, amount. Um, the summary of all of this is really that your accounting system is the core. We know that. We add on receipt management to that, that integrates really nicely. We then add your payment integrations, if that's something you choose to do. Payroll and HR, when you're at a point where you have employees and you want to make sure that's organized. And eventually you get to a point where maybe you have a CRM, customer relationship management tool, um, that then deals with your invoicing side and sales. All of that will then you know, tie nicely into a report that you can then provide to your tax accountant. Maybe you have an internal accountant, CFO, your investors, lenders, um, CRA, when they ask for it. And then of course, management, business owners, they, they want to see it. Maybe there's a board that wants to see it. Um, and so the idea is that you're just creating this like nice package ready to go for all these stakeholders that uh, will want to see it at some point. So um, I wanted to finish off with this, what comes next, because I mean, really at the end of the day, this is almost like a potential next webinar um, as to like what comes after you have this set up. But um, I just want to like give a really brief overview of what you could be doing now that you have these, um, you know, really nice apps and processes set up. Like what can you now do with this? and um, start thinking about it now. It's not absolutely necessary to do immediately, but something to really drive into as you get moving on it. So key metrics in your business that I see a lot of, and I've tried to put in the really common ones here, your, your cash burn rate and your net burn. So lately that's been a really important one um, because you wanna know what you're burning. So your cash burn rate is actually what you're spending or burning money on in a given month, for example. Um, or your net burn is essentially what you're burning in expenses less what you've actually made in income. So those are really two, uh, two good metrics to, to track, especially if you expect to receive no sales. You know, pandemic occurs, your business shuts down. Um, what does that look like? And how might that affect your cash runway? And so your cash runway is going to be, you know, a time, basically a time. So uh, number of days or number of months that you actually have cash in your bank account until you are down to zero. Um, that's a really important metric to, to understand, especially, you know, if we come into uh, come across a situation like we are in or that like we've been in, uh, where you really need to extend your cash runway for as long as possible without potentially operating. Um, so super key, something to track in your business ongoing, whether you're doing great, whether you're not doing great, it's just, it's something that's super important to keep track of. Gross profit margin, super ideal for businesses, um, e-commerce that are, you know, selling products that they originally have paid for. So like clothing store purchases a piece of clothing for a hundred dollars, um, or sorry, they purchase it for $50, they sell it for a hundred dollars. Their gross profit margin is, 50%, so it's that $50 left over. And so you kind of keep track of that and increase or decrease over time and see how you've um, improved that metric over time. Big one that I've been looking at a lot is trailing 12 months or year-to-date revenue. So actually looking at what your revenue trending is, which will help you therefore forecast going forward based on what your historical has been. Um, so I work a lot with like seasonal businesses where it's sort of up and down depending on times of the year. And so being able to like track a year to date or compare it to prior years is super important, especially when you're looking at, you know, developing a budget or a forecast in the future. And a really common one, especially with banks these days um, is EBITDA. So earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. It's a fun little word. Um, it's used a lot. And if you haven't heard of it already, you probably will at some point. It's essentially your net income after you take out all of those like weird accounting adjustments. So whatever your tax is, your depreciation, which is sort of like a non-cash adjustment. They just want to know like, how are you doing in your business after you take out all of the operating expenses um, and see how you're trending. Are you trending up? Are you trending down? And what does that look like going forward? 
So that's pretty much it. Um, I could go into a whole lot more detail in terms of metrics and growth and all of that, but that's probably for another time. Um, so I just, you know, want to say thanks again for, for those of you who that did attend and that are planning to move somewhere like in this cool cloud-based time. Um, there's obviously a whole lot to it, but it, you know, it is so crucial and important, especially just to get that like core foundation down and you could do so much with it going forward. Um, so with that, if there's any questions, I'll, I can sort of answer whatever is there for the next few minutes. Um, I've also included my email here. Um, I'll, I can actually put that in the chat once I'm done here. Um, so if you do have uh, questions going forward or later on down the road, you're welcome to email me. Um, you can also email me if you want the special offer, um, which is basically to sit kind of one-on-one -on -one with me or someone on our team to review your current setup and or your plan of what you want to do as a setup and really get like a recommendation or um, suggestion or plan on, on what that could look like and, and get some support on it. So that's sort of what we're offering for those of you that have attended. If you do want to, please reach out to this email and um, we can help you out. So that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Alex. Uh, thanks very much. That was awesome. And uh, as you say, there is a lot of information there. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I'm using a couple of the things myself and, uh, and have been a virtual business for many years. But even so, there's still so much more <laughs> that I can be doing. Uh, yeah. And uh, it, I, I just know it would be so effective. It's just a matter of slowing down long enough and, and actually focusing and spending the time to get it set up, which is why people like you are so valuable to uh, help companies through that and to get it set up. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you very much. There are a bunch of questions, so I, I will kind of moderate that. I'll, I'll uh, go through them. Some are in the chat, some are in the QA. Uh, but first of all, to the, uh, there's, it looks like there's still about 14 people on. I want to apologize for anyone who missed the first part of the session. Um, uh, I see that you were able to log in now and the session is recorded. So if you did miss anything at the beginning, you can catch it on the recording. Uh, in our efforts to improve what we do, we upgraded the version of Zoom that we're using. Unfortunately, we did that after we had opened the um, uh, event registration in Eventbrite. And so I think some people didn't get the, the new link. So my apologies for that. Uh, but uh, that has been our first hiccup in I think about eight weeks. So my apologies to Alex as well for <laughs> being the, the guinea pig on that one. But, uh, all good. but you're all here and uh, yeah, lots of questions. So let me start first with, uh, there was one from Steve uh, who uh, logged in uh, or who missed the first bit. Uh, so he said, is the only option a subscription model? Yeah, and that's a really good question. Um, I do feel like We've, I feel like the world has kind of moved into subscription based. Um, and I think it's just like to provide the ease of just it being flexible for you to like sign on and then, you know, stop the subscription if you want to. Um, the apps that we use, I think for the majority of them, it is subscription based. Um, there's not a whole lot that offers you an annual. I think one of them, for example, is sort of like an expensify, but it's still sort of an annual subscription. So it is still kind of in that format. Um, I think that's just the way that a lot of apps have gone these days uh, to probably not only make money, but um, you know, also provide flexibility for companies that want to sign on and then maybe stop the subscription for a few months. Um, it just becomes more flexible that way. Uh, yeah, actually that brings up a question that I, I have as well. I, I've been using Receipt Bank, which I guess is similar to Expensify. But um, given the procrastinator that I am, I haven't been scanning my receipts uh, as I get them uh, or even every week or even every month. And mm -hmm. uh, so just the other day, I scanned about six months worth uh, mm -hmm. and I didn't realize it, but I went over, I guess I had a, a with the subscription to, that I have to Receipt Bank, I have a limit of, I think it was 40 or 50. Uh, and so I went over that. And so they, they either didn't include them or I would have to pay more or something. Uh, so, yeah. uh, I wasn't too happy about that, but, uh, but I guess, uh, you know, I should have checked first, but is Expensify different? That's actually a really good point. So Receipt Bank, one of the reasons I don't use Receipt Bank is because they do charge based on like limits. So receipt volume limits, that kind of thing. And they'll adjust it as you add more volume. 
Mm. Um, whereas Hubdoc is kind of the other one that we use. Um, it's just a flat subscription fee. So if you don't have zero, it's $25 a month. Um, and it's just kind of a flat fee. You can, it, there's no limits on that. And if you do have zero, it's free. So it's actually a free app that you can use. Um, so that's why it's kind of nice because then you don't have to worry about it changing over time. Um, and it still has a lot of the same benefits. Cool. Well, I've got a few things to do after this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, another question here, uh, Mark says, it seems like you need about four or five different apps to get a full system going. Uh, how do you manage juggling them all? And is there one that is all encompassing? I doubt there is, but. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it is a good question. I think if I, if you really wanted to like narrow it down to like what you absolutely need, I think for sure that would be zero and hub doc or like accounting system and receipt management. That's like for sure, like number one, the other ones are in my mind core to a system because we help, we help businesses um, sort of like as an internal finance team. So we're not necessarily in their bank account logged in and all of that. So the other ones are really helpful if you have like a third party helping you, or maybe you have a bookkeeper that you don't want to have access to your bank account. So like, for example, payment systems, you can get indirect access and it's just, it's just helpful to have that. Um, but at the end of the day, like if you have a cloud-based accounting system and as receipt system, you're already ahead of the game um, by a mile at least. <laughs> so um, those are kind of like the main ones I would focus on. And um, I don't think there's anything really fully encompassing of all of that. I mean, there could be some ones out there that you would pay a lot of money for, but I think what you can get for these and the way that they work together um, is really nice. Like Zero Hubdoc, I almost consider one team, like one working app. Um, now that they're sort of working together. So that, that's a really good um, one that you could start with. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. And speaking of which, uh, Paul asks, uh, can you give us uh, the, uh, a sense of the cost of these programs? He, he was asking specifically about zero, maybe some other ones as well, but are there some mm -hmm. general costs? Yep. So zero kind of varies depending on what you're looking for. Um, aver on average, it's about uh, $30 USD per month. Um, and that's kind of like the middle of the ground option that is nice for, you know, a, a small to medium sized business. Um, I think there's even like cheaper versions of that, but we don't really go there because we like to at least have like a good base. Uh, Receipt Bank, like I said, is very, it varies. Um, so we don't love it because it, the price changes. Um, Hubdoc, $25 per month. I, I want to say that's in Canadian, but don't quote me on it. Um, or free if you have zero. Expensify, I believe, is $9 per active user per month um, if you kind of sign up for a certain number of users. So it is a little bit hefty in price, especially if you have a lot of users, but super effective um, just with keeping track of things. Uh, Pluto, I believe, is also a monthly subscription of $25 a month plus um, small transaction fees um, to actually process payments. But I, I think it's only useful using Pluto if you have a, a, enough payments going through to make it worth your while of paying that subscription fee. Um, is there any that I missed? There's, a, there's so many out there, but um, I think all in, all in all, you're probably looking at about ideally like $100 a month in your subscription fees if you had like a really nice core set of apps. Mm -hmm. And actually, you were talking about um, in the prices there, you mentioned Canadian and US dollars, and it made me think a, a little pet peeve of mine is uh, I'm using uh, FreshBooks, who used to be a Canadian company, they were bought now by a US company, but even when they were a Canadian company, they would charge uh, in US dollars. Uh, and um, mm. Hootsuite is another company in, in Vancouver that's even closer, that's a Canadian company, also charging in US, which... Uh, Bothered That's a trend. Me. Bit, a bit of a pet peeve, and especially as the US dollar continues to get stronger and the Canadian weaker. Yeah. So, not really a question there, but I uh, just wanted to point that out. Um, but somebody does ask um, uh, Is there a better option, uh, Zero or QuickBooks online? Or which is the better option, Zero or QuickBooks? I mean, depends who you ask, but if you ask me, I'll always say Zero. 
Um, I am a big fan of zero. We, you know, I, I feel like in a way I'm biased because that's all like majority of what we use and we know it really well and it works really well. Um, but at the same time, QBO is like pretty similar. I, I would say it's very in line. We just, some of the features with zero just work nicely, like the integrations, the, what you can do with the reporting and the presentation um, is super ideal for us. So that's what we like. Cool. A couple other questions coming in here. A um, bit of a longer one. Could you please talk a bit more about CRM programs? You mentioned uh, Salesforce, HubSpot, also an accounting, uh, as an accounting firm, how, do you have any programs such as Caseware, Tax Cycle, and run them on the cloud or a workaround that? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point on the accounting firm front, because I mean, we personally, like we don't do tax or anything, but I've, I've done a lot of that in the past and uh, Zero now has a working paper system um, that's actually now supposed to support year end notice reader, that kind of thing. I don't know a ton about it and I don't know if it's actually working as well or not. And I think it, it takes time to really nail that down. Um, but I'm, I believe there's now an option to like get your reporting out of zero for like year end stuff um, and to potentially integrate it or somewhat integrate it into a cloud based tax system or caseware. I think there's caseware cloud now, but I'm, I don't know where that's at. Um, so I think there's ways, I think it's slower when you, when you want to look at how it supports tax in year end, it's a bit of a slower process, but they are working on getting that to a better place. Um, and on the CRM front, it, I, I don't know if it's related to that or not, but, um, in terms of like what I know about it, it it's sort of, it's, it's not something that I, I see really common with a lot of companies. Like, I don't think it's something you have right away or you have developed into your business, but I've seen it work so well, um, in tracking, especially if you're looking at growth and sales and marketing and all of that it's really ideal to start tracking that in a system ideally that can integrate with your accounting system because then all of your invoicing and you know, your current customers are, are in zero, but your potential customers or your pipeline or your marketing tools are in this other CRM that feeds through. So hope that sort of answers it. Mm, excellent. Okay. Thanks. Uh, here's a more specific question. Um, most of my expenses are related to a specific client. Does Zero offer the ability to allocate an invoice to a project or client? Yes, so they do have their project-based module. Um, we haven't used it a ton, I don't think. We, we, like that module specifically, I, I don't have a ton of experience on. But I do know there is an option to set up customer projects. So um, from, what I, from what I've heard, you can set up your customers and kind of rebuild those expenses. So if you classify an expense to that customer, you could then add it onto the invoice if you're billing them back for it or just keep it as a customer project um, so that the reporting can come out that way and you can then see your customer-based tracking um, in the reporting as well as what you're invoicing them. So there is something like that. I don't know a ton about it, but I've, I've heard it works well. Cool. Okay, and Barbara asks, are you using a separate third party cloud hosting service to manage data storage, security, backups, et cetera? That's a very good question. Um, you mentioned Dropbox, which would do yeah. storage, but not so much security and backups. The security side, I think is, yeah. So, so what we use now, we use, we actually use Dropbox um, for us specifically, because I think it, it, automatically has a backup um, with that. And uh, so in a way it's nice because we can deal with that in the cloud, but we are a virtual firm. So we need to be able to it to store and to backup as well. So we like Dropbox because there's backup options and you know, you can kind of save your data easily. Um, in terms of the security, not sure. I think maybe I need IT, some, maybe I need to attend an IT webinar and I can tell you more about it. Yeah, I was just thinking uh, there's uh, somebody else who has presented at um, some of the Soho's uh, who's in the IT field. Uh, and that might be a nice uh, kind of combination webinar mm. is, is the, you know, the kind of combination of accounting and, and IT. And so securities, in some ways, they go hand in hand. Totally. So That'd might be, be a good follow up. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, here's a bit of a longer one from Scott. Uh, there are really great free solutions that you haven't mentioned. For example, Wave Accounting as a free receipt app integration to your Wave Accounting cloud software. At what point would you recommend a client go with the paid services? Is this based on uh, revenue level or client needs? Yes, great question. Um, Wave and FreshBooks, so they're, they're great. I actually do recommend them to certain people and, and the, the people and companies that I recommend them to are generally sole proprietors. Uh, so if you are a sole proprietor, like kind of starting on your own contract work, they're a great starting point to at least get your invoices out, things kind of moved online and organized. Um, so I guess my answer to that is at the point that you should really switch to something like that I've mentioned is really when you are a corporation or, um, you know, definitely if, if you have plans to like grow or raise money or, you know, even just be a business that is, you know, making a hundred thousand or more in annual revenues, I think it, it is just super ideal to like start there now so that you have that history building up and um, you're not having to transition later on once you make that move. So if you are a sole proprietor and you are incorporating, that is like a perfect time to move over um, technically. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, it's almost 12 o'clock. We've got two more questions. One I can answer really quick uh, and then we'll get to the last one and then uh, we will um, call it a day. The, the first question from Paul asks, Chris, when are you getting your haircut? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer awesome. is 530 today. <laughs> I've nice. got an appointment booked finally with the, uh, <laughs> the hair folks. So there you go. Uh, and then the other question is, uh, do you use a virtual desktop model? I'm not sure what that is, but do you know what a virtual desktop model is? Desktop model. Um, I don't know what that means. I, I don't know if it's like a desktop accounting software that, that we can use. From, oh, I was just going to ask uh, Anne, Anne Chow if you could, uh, oh, here it is. Virtual desktop model example, Amazon Workspace. Oh, yeah, um, we actually use something like, I don't know if this is similar or not, but we, we use parallels. So if we were to have to get something on the desktop or whatever, we actually, um, it's kind of like Amazon Workspace. It does something similar, but you, you can technically use a desktop virtually so that you can take it anywhere. Um, I, I don't think it's as common because a lot of our, our apps are based kind of in the cloud and um, on those platforms. So definitely less common for sure. Hmm. Interesting. Well, this has been great. I've certainly learned a ton and uh, I know all of the, uh, the attendees have as well. So Alex's email address is there for anyone who wants to uh, take her up on the offer to do a review of your systems. Uh, and that would be super beneficial, I'm sure. Uh, so again, uh, the session is being recorded. So uh, watch for that. You'll get an email with that later if you did miss any of it. But um, I want to uh, thank Alex again very much and, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, thank you. If you, uh, yeah, if you wanna register for next week's session, I did put the link in there. So um, that one uh, hopefully is gonna run a little more smoothly now, but it's set up uh, to register for uh, the session with Bosco and Vicky. Uh, but, uh, and uh, where can they find you? Uh, in terms of your website, Alex, is it virtual CFO? Yeah, virtual CFO.ca, pretty easy um, to remember. So if, if you want to find out more info, especially on zero, we have a lot of uh, support there.